We are here to review key data regarding smoking death rates from EU countries, um, but specifically Greece today. Um, and we've put this data together as part of an EU election campaign, as the EU elections are due to take place between the 6th and the 9th of June this year. This webinar will consult the expertise of Dr. Konstantinos Varselinos, a cardiologist from Greece. Um, and we're going to keep the webinar to approximately 20 to 30 minutes, just a short one today. So welcome, Dr. Konstantinos Varselinos. It's great to see you as always. Thank you um, very much. Thank you once again for the invitation. Of course. Of course, it's a pleasure. Um, last year and continuing to this year, we've been running a campaign about Sweden, highlighting their tobacco control policies and their approach to harm reduction and consumer access to smoking cessation products. Their unique approach has led to Sweden's smoking rates plummeting to 5.6% in 2023, which is a world first. And this campaign aims to highlight the reasons for these low smoking rates and subsequent death rates from smoking related diseases and compare them with other countries. So for the purpose of this webinar, we'll look at an infographic which compares the smoking death rates from Sweden and Greece. Um, and so we're going to ask Dr. Konstantinos Varsalinos to comment on the infographic and the difference in those smoking death rates. Um, so what I will do, Konstantinos, is I'll share my screen and yes. you'll see the infographic with any luck. Right, can you see that? Yes. Oh, you can see it's, it, good. It's, it's in Greek. <laughs> That's perfect. Feel free to translate what it says on the screen for our audience. Uh, Jesse, do you want to quickly translate what it shows? Well, it, it says uh, deaths associated with smoking and that Sweden has 47% fewer deaths uh, compared to Greece. Perfect. Thank you. So as you can see from this graphic that Sweden has 47% lower smoking death rates than Greece. What do you think that Sweden's smoking debt? Why do you think, apologies, that Sweden's smoking death rates are so much lower than in Greece? And perhaps speaking about the smoking habits of Greek people and providing some context regarding Greece itself and its population might help. Well, it's more than obvious that this uh, difference in smoking and tobacco related deaths are associated with a, a large difference in smoking rates between the two countries. Greece has been traditionally a, a very fanatic smoking country, I must say. Uh, the smoking rates uh, have been very, very, very high in the past, exceeding 40% uh, in the general population, exceeding 50% among men. Uh, but women, in women also, uh, smoking was quite prevalent. Uh, unlike in some other countries where there are very big differences between um, women and men in smoking rates. Uh, we have seen a significant improvement in Greece. Over the past uh, several years, smoking rates have been going down. In 2017, when we did a study which was basically about examining e-cigarette use in the population, uh, we found the smoking rates to be around 33%. Now I think they're just they're below 30%. Uh, I must say that this reduction in smoking rates in Greece has been um, uh, associated, maybe has been has coincided, to be more exact, with uh, the introduction of novel harm reduction products and the um, increased uh, awareness and popularity of these products. So uh, in 2017, already um, the e-cigarette use rate was 5% in the general population with um, uh, adult population with the vast majority, I'm talking about more than 98.5% being current and former smokers. Um, and uh, since then, mainly in 2016 to 2017, we had the introduction of heated tobacco products in the market, and uh, they have been quite popular. Unfortunately, the problem is data collection. We don't have enough data. Basically, we tried to do some research, but we couldn't find the relevant funding for it in order to see how the smoking rates may be uh, link to the availability and to the use of harm reduction products. Uh, we've seen uh, some data which are mainly coming from um, uh, information released from the industry itself, uh, but we haven't seen a large population representative survey 
that would determine uh, and especially examine former smokers to see how they have managed to quit smoking and what if any a nicotine containing product they are using now. I'm, uh, I, I strongly suspect that we're going to find a substantial link, something that, for example, we have seen in Japan, where the smoke, the cigarette sales have gone down to almost 50 percent uh, from uh, 180 billion tobacco cigarettes in 2015, 2016 to uh, less than 100 billion in 2022. Uh, an amazing uh, difference, an amazing reduction, which coincided with the introduction and the very fast adoption from uh, smokers of uh, heated tobacco products there. Um, I suspect that there is something similar happening happening in Greece, but we haven't um, documented it. And that's the importance, you know, of research. There are some surveys that um, are being performed on the smoking rate, but no one has attempted to make this link. And how do you make the link? You simply um, look at current and former smokers and their past attempts to quit or what they're using now for spe specifically for former smokers. No one has been doing that because, you know, unfortunately, no one is really interested in tobacco harm reduction. So we have a sort of a success rate in Greece in terms of reduction in smoking rates, nothing similar to Sweden. But what is important and I would like to address for Sweden is that uh, Sweden has low smoking, but not low nicotine use rates. Uh, let's not forget that the nicotine use rate in Sweden is identical uh, without any statistical significance, uh, any statistically significant difference to the, to the nicotine use rate in the rest of the European Union. What is different in Sweden compared to the rest of the European Union is the source of nicotine intake. So in Sweden, the main source of nicotine intake for the population is snooze, as we know. Instead, in normal other countries, including Greece, the main source of nicotine intake is uh, has been the tobacco cigarette. And looking at the difference in smoking and tobacco-related deaths in Sweden compared to the other uh, countries, uh, EU member states, I think it is important to emphasize that this uh, is a determining factor. We shouldn't look uh, at nicotine use rate. We should, we should look at smoking rates. And uh, by doing this, we will understand how valuable uh, harm reduction has been in Sweden. Sweden is today the only basically smoke-free country in the world. But since this product, Snooze, a harm reduction product, has been used in Sweden traditionally, we already have the outcome of this in terms of uh, population health effects. So uh, the very low smoking rates, the, uh, accompanied by very low death rates from lung cancer, from cancer in other organs, from cardiovascular disease, even from oral cancer, because there has been a lot of speculation and misperception about an oral smokeless tobacco product co causing or being linked with a, an increased risk for oral cancer, it has not been the case with snus. Uh, so Sweden, and especially men, because let's not forget that men has largely adopted snus use in, instead of smoking. And now with the evolution of nicotine pouches, uh, pouches are becoming a more appealing product for women to substitute for smoking. Uh, and this is something that we need to emphasize. So we need to learn the lesson. And I think Greece, which has been a very bad example in, ter in, in terms of smoking, uh, we need to learn the lessons from Sweden. And I must emphasize, we need to look at the evidence and look for data to examine if there is any link between the reduction in smoking rates that we are uh, observing in Greece, which of course are still too high, but lower than in the past, uh, with the introduction, availability, 
appeal and use of harm reduction products in the country. Um, there has been uh, there have been some improvements in uh, the regulators and government's approach to tobacco harm reduction. Unfortunately, in the past, the government was pretty much opposed to harm reduction. And they tried to introduce several restrictions in the legislation concerning harm reduction products. Um, the government today is uh, quite supportive of harm reduction. Of course, not vocal to the level of, for example, the UK authorities, but uh, at least they understand that harm reduction can be an ally in smoking control and in reducing smoking rates instead of what has been unfortunately very common throughout Europe, considering harm reduction as a threat to uh, smoking control efforts. Um, Sweden and the Swedish population mainly, not so much the regulatory authorities, have been a brilliant a bright example. They have achieved to become a smoke-free country uh, 13, uh, 17 years before the EU set goal of having uh, a smoke-free European Union. And to be honest, with the current approach, I doubt that even uh, 2040 uh, is uh, good enough to set that goal and to achieve that goal. Um, Without harm reduction, and that's, I think, the main point in conclusion, you can't uh, have a smoke-free country without adopting harm reduction. That's the reality. Uh, I understand that in an, an ideal world, we, sh we could have no nicotine use, but in the same way, we would have no crime, no traffic accidents, no death from diseases. We don't live in an ideal world. We need to be pragmatic. We need to be realistic. We need to see the example of a country which has become smoke-free, and we need to follow this example. Um, all very good points. Thank you, Konstantinos. Um, these novel product adopters in Greece, um, do you have any demographic data on who they are? So is it more men than women? Do you have any age data, like any indication of who these people are? Well, unfortunately, our, da our data are dated back in 2017 when we did a population representative study in the prefecture of Attica, which basically covers half of the Greek population. Um, and uh, at that time, the, the um, e-cigarette use rate was 5%. And we only examined the cigarette use because uh, heated tobacco products were just introduced into the market. There was not enough time for, um, for adoption by the population. So basically, the only harm reduction product that we had was electronic cigarettes. 5% rate, we found that um, in the prefecture, there were 150,000 people who had quit smoking and were using electronic cigarettes, uh, quite large numbers. We also found for the first time that the smoking rates were less than 40%. There were 33% at that time. Uh, electronic cigarettes were the most popular smoking cessation aid used by the population. Um, there were a lot of failures. I mean, a lot of uh, current smokers who tried electronic cigarettes, but were not using electro electronic cigarettes anymore. Uh, so um, again, it was a time where products were not uh, so refined uh, as they are today. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is that we cannot find the funding to uh, re-examine these issues because, as you understand, you need to monitor the situation in the population at least on an annual basis. And unfortunately, we haven't done that. We focused on looking at the link between harm reduction products and smoking. So examine the smoking patterns, past and current, of um, uh, harm reduction product users. In that case, as I said, electronic cigarette users. This is something that needs to be repeated. It needs to be repeated because that's the only way of uh, looking at the evolution and looking also at future trends. You can't identify trends by just looking at, um, um, at, at the evidence at one time point only. Um, and this is the message. We need to focus uh, not only on just reporting uh, smoking rates and uh, harm reduction product use rates. That's useless, basically. We need to study the link between the two. 
we need to study what's the association and what are the uh, 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 interchanges between different behaviors with the introduction of, of these uh, harm reduction products. Unfortunately, we are lacking data on that. And when you lack, you don't have the data, you can't make definitive conclusions and you can't make definitive con um, um, uh, uh, considerations and, uh, and recommendations. But um, we are seeing, and um, Greece is a country where harm reduction use is visible on the streets. Uh, you see people uh, using products. Um, it's quite easy to find products in the market. We don't have severe restrictions like many other countries. We don't have bans. Um, and uh, we just need to document not only the use, but most importantly, patterns of use and current and former smoking habits of these users. I'd like to take a slight sidestep and mention caffeine, which um, I think is a very interesting topic. So as we know that there are similarities between nicotine and caffeine, um, do you have any comments regarding um, the learnings that we've got from, from caffeine regarding the societal acceptability of caffeine and perhaps a new approach that society, society could take regarding nicotine? Well, I think that the relevance with caffeine um, goes beyond the similarities between the two compounds. It goes to the point of um, uh, understanding what is the purpose and what is the goal of public health, public health measures and the public health debate. So public health is about disease and death. It's not a, a moralistic discussion judging behaviors. So public health never discussed about caffeine, despite caffeine being one of the most dependent substances in terms of the number of people, the proportion of the population uh, being dependent to some extent to caffeine. And we know that probably globally, the proportion of the population being dependent on caffeine is much, much larger, um, higher compared to the proportion of the population being dependent on nicotine. But there has never been any public health debate about caffeine because caffeine no, causes no harm. In terms of nicotine, uh, we, we are now seeing, because of course there's overwhelming uh, evidence now after so many years about the uh, relative risk of harm reduction products, specific, especially electronic cigarettes. So the discussion has shifted to the issue of dependence, which of course they call addiction, in my opinion it's dependence, and it's dependence because we know for decades that nicotine uh, itself is associated with minimal, if any, uh, disease. And snooze, which is not even pure nicotine, it's a nicotine-containing tobacco product, uh, has taught us uh, so many lessons uh, with the epidemiological evidence that we have available over many, many years about the relative risk of nicotine. This is, I think, the most valuable source of information, data, and evidence concerning the harms of nicotine itself. So we know that nicotine has minimal, if any, harms. So the discussion about dependence on nicotine is relevant from a public health perspective only if we discuss about products that cause harm like tobacco cigarettes. Uh, if you would need to smoke in order to obtain caffeine, then we would have a public health debate about caffeine, but because of the source of caffeine intake. In this case, we do have a public health debate about nicotine because of tobacco cigarettes being a source of nicotine intake. For the rest of the product that uh, contain either naturally occurring uh, nicotine like heat tobacco products, which are tobacco products, or pharmaceutical grade nicotine extracted from tobacco like electronic cigarettes, uh, like we see in electronic cigarettes and in nicotine pouches. The debate about public health should not be about dependence. It should be about the relative and absolute risk of these products compared to, to um, uh, smoking uh, or the absolute risk by itself.
but it's not this risk is not coming from nicotine. And that's why I don't understand in Europe this frenzy, I must call it, or concerning nicotine pouches. Nicotine pouches is definitely the least harmful of all nicotine products. They are basically the same as nicotine replacement therapies in terms of the content. They only contain nicotine, nothing else. And you don't eat, you don't combust nicotine or the contents of the nicotine pouch. And we are seeing a paradoxical situation of governments banning nicotine pouches. So banning basically a nicotine replacement therapy that is not, of course, being produced or sold by pharmaceutical companies. But there is no difference between a nicotine pouch and an RTS. So it doesn't make sense because at the same time, all these countries are allowing the legal sales of uh, tobacco cigarettes, the most lethal uh, nicotine containing product. So I think that the public health debate should focus on harm. And let's discuss about the harm, uh, absolute and relative, of all alternative to smoking uh, nicotine containing products. But the debate shouldn't be focused only on um, dependence, because this is a, a moralistic debate, judging behaviors and judging people's choices. It's not about harm, and it makes no sense. Um, it would maybe make sense uh, if we had eliminated uh, smoking, but you know we haven't. You know that in, in Europe, 23 to 25 uh, percent of the adult population is smoking. Globally, we have 1.2 billion smokers. And that is happening after 60 years of knowledge about the harms caused by smoking. So there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think that eventually after six decades, we need to understand that we cannot eliminate smoking unless we provide a less harmful alternative uh, nicotine containing product to these people. And that's the purpose and role of harm reduction as a public health strategy. And that's the purpose and role of a harm reduction product. Can you buy oral nicotine pouches in Greece currently? Yes, we can find oral nicotine pouches in Greece, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future because there are many countries which uh, have already banned or are in the process of banning uh, nicotine pouches. I'll give you a characteristic example. Belgium, they have banned the nicotine pouches and they will also want to add further restrictions. Um, for example, uh, just now, um, tomorrow, there is the deadline for a public consultation in Spain who wants to uh, uh, restrict ban flavors in electronic cigarettes. They also want to more or less equalize tobacco cigarettes with harm reduction products and probably in the future introduce plain packaging, um, graphic and text health warning messages to harm reduction products, which, as you understand, creates a lot of misperceptions and uh, very, very uh, scientifically unjustified uh, and unbased um, messages to the population that will only create a confusion. The, everyone will think that these harm reduction products are of equal harm to uh, smoking. And by the way, in 2017, when we did the study uh, in Greece, among the smoking population, only 5% uh, responded that electronic cigarettes are by far less harmful than smoking. And about 35 to 40% responded that they, that they are equally or more harmful than smoking. So you understand that this is a misconception uh, that shows we have a serious public health issue because if people don't know and don't understand reality and what the evidence is showing, then we're doing something very wrong. And one final brief question for you. In your opinion, does the scientific evidence show that nicotine causes cancer or disease? Nicotine is not even listed as a carcinogen, so uh, it's not a matter of being a personal opinion. There have there has been some some discussion about nicotine acting as a tumor promoter, which means that it doesn't cause the appearance of the tumors, but it just facilitates 
um, tumor progression. We haven't seen any real clinical evidence on that. And as I said, SNUS use, and with SNUS, we have meta-analysis of evidence. So the highest level quality of evidence, epidemiological evidence, uh, and we don't see any increase in, in, in cancer rates. Uh, so I think that this is not something of a debate. Uh, we know about that. Concerning cardiovascular disease, I know that there has been a lot of confusion because of the acute effects of nicotine. And we know that nicotine, when you obtain nicotine at the time that you're smoking or using other products, you have an elevation, in, um, an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, that means nothing in terms of the uh, chronic long-term risk, risk, because I will remind you that exercise results in an acute increase in heart rate and blood pressure. But exercise is a protective factor. It's not a, a, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. I'm not suggesting that these products or nicotine itself is a protective factor for cardiovascular disease. I'm just saying that the acute effect of one behavior uh, has no relevance and no prognostic value in terms of the long-term health effects. And that has been also displayed in the scientific literature uh, with a study, I think, published in 2019, showing that uh, people who quit smoking with electronic cigarettes had major and statistically significant improvement in arterial function within four weeks after quitting. And there was no difference in the improvement between those who quit with uh, nicotine containing cigarettes compared to those who quit with nicotine free electronic cigarettes. And that shows that nicotine doesn't play a role in the uh, improvement that you uh, see by switching from smoking to other nicotine containing products. So um, uh, the evidence of nicotine uh, and the harms caused by nicotine has been largely experimental and based on laboratory uh, cell and animal studies, which have never been verified in humans. And I will repeat, snooze research is a major source of information concerning the harms associated with nicotine. And let's not forget that SNUS is not a pure nicotine product. It is a tobacco product containing nicotine. And still, harms are, are minimal. I, I would avoid saying that it's completely harmless, but I would say that they are absolutely minimal and there is no comparison with uh, tobacco cigarettes.